Greetings. We're going to continue. Still waiting on, on Praxis and CLO to get, get us something to announce here, but um, Hillsdale College hat. Uh, we're going to continue with our discussion of Walrasian general equilibrium. When we left off, we raised the issue of existence of the equilibrium, and so that's what we'll treat, treat now. Here's how Walras treats, uh, how he models the entire economy. I'm going to show that. And he sees the economy as being a system of simultaneous equations. That's his approach. So I'm going to do a very simple form here. We're just going to have an assumption of n different goods. n can be any number you like, as big as possible, as big as, as, big as you wish. And so we'll represent that as good x1, good x2, all the way up to good xn. And they will each have, for their respective markets, a price p1 through pn. Great. And so here's how Walras is going to, going to represent this. Think about, uh, we'll think about um, the demand for good X. And remember, that comes from the individual demands. So for good X, one, quantity demanded for good X, one, is equal to a function of, we'll just put an F for function. I'll put an F1 to show that we're good one, of the amount of the price, the amount that will be demanded on the market, quantity demanded, is a function of the price of the good, but as we said before, also all the other prices. So the markets are all linked through this. Great, PN. And similarly, we can then think about supply. And the, for the supply, it will also be for every good. It'll be a different function, obviously, because this is a supply curve. Um, P1, P2, dot, 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 Pn, great, great. The demand for good X, one is a function of all of those things. Some might have a positive effect. That would be a complement. Uh, some might be a substitute. Uh, that'd be a negative effect, et cetera. And the same thing over here. Great, all right. Now, he then uses that to develop the excess demand function. This is how he'll put it all together. The excess demand function is, we'll call it this, and notice that for this, we're going to have, have one of these things for every one of those goods and a different one of these for every one of those goods, a supply and demand. So I'm just going to call it xi for the ith one. And so we'll do that over here. The excess demand function, ED I, is equal to the quantity demanded uh, for good XI minus the quantity supplied for good XI. That's the excess demand function. Cool. Well, notice that if that's greater than zero, if it's greater than zero, what do we call that? That is to say, if the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied, I would call that, typically you'd say shortage, or as he says, excess demand. It's a shortage or excess demand. There's greater, demand, greater quantity demanded than there is supplied. So we'll call it excess demand. And similarly, if we have the reverse hold, if that holds, then of course we have surplus or excess supply more formally. Great. And what is the condition for an equilibrium in this market is simply that that equals zero quantity demanded, quantity supplied. And remember, those are both functions of all the prices. I just didn't write them down. Great. OK. Here's general equilibrium. In this framework, general equilibrium is the case where we have the excess demand for good one, excess demand for good two, excess demand for good three, dot, 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 excess demand for good n, quantity demanded, quantity supplied, that market clears, that market clears, 
that market clears, that market clears. Every single one of those is zero. Okay. That, would be the, that would be the case of general equilibrium. That's what's going on there. Now, here's how Walras treats the question of, does this, does this exist? And uh, he says, well, we have n minus 1 independent equations. And uh, we also have, all, we have, well, we have n equations, n variables. Ha! Huh, we have just shown that it exists. That's, that's all he says. Um, and that's actually not sufficient to show. I won't give you an example of this, but you could write down uh, examples in which you have a very simple economy with demand and supply functions, and then you uh, compute the equilibrium, and you find, I've got one here, where the price of good one is the square root of negative one. What's that? Well, that isn't a, that's not very, very helpful if that's, if that's where the math takes us. And so you have to consider that for some markets, you might end up with something like the following. Something a little more down to earth that we can follow. Um, the, uh, you might end up with something like the following. Suppose that you have a market where we have uh, this. There's the demand, there's the supply. And there's the demand, and the intersection is in negative quantity space. Well, that's not very helpful, but you might end up with that with your general equilibrium setup. Or you might end up with something like the following, where we have, uh, there's the demand, there's the supply, Oh good, negative prices. That's not very helpful. What's that mean? Um, so the real story is that you have to have n independent equations or there's no solution. And supply, uh, the, the answer, they have to, ex these things have to all intersect in this positive space, this positive orthant or quadrant, um, that positive space. That is the prices have to be positive, the quantities have to be positive, or this doesn't hold together and make sense. Um, and to work this out in any kind of a serious fashion takes until well into the 20th century to handle the mathematics. Um, now, so while Roz is naively uh, approaching this, works with it, he does come up with something that is important, uh, very important, and that is what is called Walras Law. And he says, if there is excess demand in one market, there has to be excess supply in at least one other market. Let me repeat that. This is on your exam. This is a, it's more important than that. You need to know this. Um, it's more important than exams. You need to know it in life. If there's excess demand in one market, there must be excess supply in at least one more market, one other market. Okay. Those markets are linked, and that's also true of the real world. Um, have you heard of this before? If you were in uh, HET 1, Cantillon made the same argument. He said that if there's a surplus, too much stuff being done in one market means there must not be too many resources going into that market, must be not enough in a different market, and entrepreneurs will be the one to adjust that. So Austrians are actually uh, thinking about these kinds of things. Um, if you, you can also see the connection with the Austrian story of the Austrian criticism of Marshall's real cost theory. When Marshall says, well, the, the uh, supply uh, curve is objective, and the Austrians say, no, the supply curve being upward sloping is because you're pulling resources out of some other market, and that's a loss of utility. You have to think of it in that sense. The Austrians see the connection. And this is what, what uh, Walras is pointing out with Walras' law. In fact, I'd I, I best write that down. Walras' law is that um, excess demand, the sum of the excess demands is zero, and therefore, 
in, well, we already know that, we know, or already know that. Outside of equilibrium, we already know that. That is that, that means that in equilibrium, they're all zero. But outside of equilibrium, excess demand in one market means at least one other market has excess supply. That's crucial. That's important for understanding what, what he's getting on about. Now, I've got an entire page of the page, two, three, four, five, how many, six? Uh, I don't think we want to go through all of those uh, pages of algebra. And in fact, I often uh, skip them uh, for the course, but I may send some of this out for you to take a look at. But uh, we have a simple demonstration, and it's a little bit mathy, of Walras law. I'd like to go through that and show it to you. Um, why do would we think this to, to make sense? Because it isn't just something that we're asserting, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, asserting as a, you don't take it on faith. So let's do a simple example. And we can leave that up. Yeah, grab our another marker and we're gonna have two goods, and we're gonna have two groups of people, no production. We're gonna assume each group is homogeneous. This is just for simplicity, it's not required, but we've got the group A consumers and the group B consumers. No production, they're just trading um, goods X and Y and consuming them. And we're gonna assume everyone is a price taker, okay? So, group A, begins with an endowment. This is actually a technical term in economics for what you begin with. What kind of resources or consumption goods in this case do you start with? And they begin with an endowment of some amount, X bar A and X bar, sorry, Y bar A, goods X and Y. So they, and the groups are A and B. They start with Y bar A. And group B has an endowment of, not surprisingly, X bar B and Y bar B. Awesome. Great. So, Walras Law says that equilibrium in one market, since we only have two goods, will mean that we have equilibrium in the other one. Because excess supply in one market will mean excess demand in the other market. Let's see why that is. So we're going to start out with a budget constraint for each group. And remember, consumers have to stay within the budget constraint. Well, what is the budget? Well, here's group A. And so we'll do the budget constraint for A. The budget constraint for group A is the price of X times the amount of X they have plus the price of Y times the amount of Y that they have. Great. That is the value of their total endowment. Cool. And when they finally ultimately consume, that's the value of their starting wealth. And when they consume, their final consumption has to stay within that. So their final consumption will be PX, XA plus PY, YA, where XA is the amount that they end up consuming, and that's the amount they end up consuming of goods X and Y. Okay? If they don't consume what they have, they have to get it somewhere. Uh, if they consume something different from what they start with, they'll have to get it from somewhere else, which is group B. So they have a potential to trade. Well, let's go ahead and rewrite this. And we end up with, I'm going to, what shall I do? Let's go ahead and divide both sides by PY. 
and we end up with px py huh that looks like a relative price in fact it is a relative price and the other thing i'm going to do is uh well no, i'll just do that right now xa y bar a equals uh, px py xa plus ya and in this case y is what Walras and what we call another technical term learn that it's called a, a numeraire it is the good that we are going to use to measure prices okay all prices that are effectively calculated in terms of good y like how much good if i consume an x how much good y did it cost me that's what that's telling us right there if i consume a, a unit of y i know how much y it cost a unit of y um, so great next thing i'm going to do is um, what shall we do um, we'll rearrange this by subtracting this from both sides of our equation let's do that and I shall erase this. Rearranging terms, what we end up with is xa minus xa bar minus xa plus ya bar minus ya equals zero. Okay. So what do I have here now? That is group A's demand for good X. That is group A's demand for good Y. Okay. Now, stop and think a second. If they consume exactly what they have, then that equals that, and that equals that, and good, we're done. Uh, they, that's a zero, and that's a zero, and that's zero. But suppose that they wanted to consume more good Y than they started with. Well, that's negative. Therefore, that must be positive. Or suppose they wanted to consume more good X than they started with, so they have to trade. Well, that means, since that's negative, that has to be positive, right? Right. Okay, those things will have to balance. They have to sum. Now, we got that from obeying the budget constraint. Okay, great. So either both of their demands are zero, or one is negative, one's positive, that would mean they're supplying the good. Okay, great. So again, the verbal logic, if you, don't, if you don't consume what you started with, you have to trade for something you don't have um, so that you can consume something different than you started with. Great. So next we'll do uh, the same thing for group B. Well, what do I have to do? Just pretend that all those A's are B's. We end up with the same statement for group B. And so let's go ahead and write that down. Um, and get me that. And I hate to say it, but this is such an algebraic exercise. Um, so it's a little bit, I'm sure, thrilling to watch me write this stuff down. But let's go ahead and rewrite it. So we've got there's y bar a minus y a equals zero, and we also know that uh, px py for x bar b minus x b plus those things also are equal to zero. Great. Well, I've just shown you something that's actually kind of important. Um, if I add up these things, I'm going to sum those and get the entire economy. Add that up, and I can rewrite this as the following. Um, Px, Py, I'm going to add that to that, and I'll just call, if I add that to that, let's just call that x bar. So x bar is just defined as xa bar plus xb bar. We get x bar minus 
xa minus xb. Oh, do I know how to make an x? Um, I know how. Can I? That's the real question. All right, there we go. And we'll do the same thing here. And so that would give us, um, using the same idea, plus y bar minus y a minus y b. And if we add up a bunch of zeros, we get zero. Wow. Okay. I just showed Walras law because this whole thing equals zero. So if they are demanding, if those two things are greater than that, so that the uh, excess demand is positive there, or sorry, excess demand is, if those are greater than that, that's negative, it must be positive over here. If it's positive over here, it's got to be negative here, vice versa. If that one's negative, that one's got to be positive because we know that they sum to zero. That's the excess demand across the whole economy. That's the excess demand across the whole economy for this good. And there's the general equilibrium statement. If one of them is out of equilibrium, at least one more has to be out of equilibrium. Walras law, and we just established it. Wow, awesome. All right, on that happy note, I'm gonna take a break because uh, it's a little bit of algebraic uh, density there. But think about what that might mean. Um, is this just, a, just an arbitrary kind of, a, kind of a story? Well, again, Cantillon argued that if we have, and many, many Austrians, that if you have one market out of equilibrium, must be another market out of equilibrium because that out of equilibrium means there's too much resource or not enough resource being devoted there. Well, where do you get the other resource? From a different market. Okay, great. One market imbalance means there must be others. That's what Walras law is telling us. Uh, here's an application of that. John Maynard Keynes, at least in many Keynesian models, argues that in the explanation uh, for, the, for, a, for a recession or depression is that there's really one market out of equilibrium, the labor market. One market out of equilibrium is not, is not consistent with this. Now, I don't know if that's the best uh, criticism of the Keynesian model, but it's one that Mark Blaug has, le has leveled at the Keynesian model. So there's something to this that's, Im that's important. You need to consider it. So on that, that actually is a, an interesting note. This stuff might have some applicability. We shall stop and we shall return uh, with part two of our Walrasian, part three, I guess, of our lecture on Leon Walras.